You saw it from producer two. That's right. He was in front of the camera for the first Road to Paris. He usually comes on for the sign off, but uh, always almost six months now. Little Austin's on, so he's now telling me what to do, and we are rolling. Now I know that this is a Road to Paris. We talk about beach volleyball on this show. But I just have to give a shout out to my O's. I usually wear shirts representative of what's happened in the beach volleyball world. However, the O's just claimed the division. Just a couple years ago, we had only won 52 games and we're 48 out of first place. Now we are in first place to go along with my Maryland Terrapins, 5-0 and on the football field. Baltimore Ravens, 3-1 and on the football field. Morale is high here in the Sandcast studio. As you can see, if you're watching our new setup in the studio kudos of the pod mama we just continue to upgrade because we have the best pod mama in the biz shout out to gabby born wonder woman now morale is also as high as it can get in brazil or at least for the brazilian women so in 2022 in the wake of the tokyo olympic games and the world tour finals that year in cagliari italy there was a void left by april ross and alex Kleiman, who was the best team in the world. 2022, there wasn't really a sure answer. Yes, Anna Patricia and Duda had made a case late in the year. Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes made a case. A number of teams had made a decent argument for that best team in the world, but there was no team that was the standard bearer. That question has now been answered. I think it's been answered for a couple months now in the season, but the exclamation point was put on in Paris is Anna Patricia and Duda. They won their fourth gold medal of the season. So there have been eight Elite 16s this year, four have been won by Anna, Patricia, and Duda, and four have been won by the rest of the world. And it's not just that they're winning. The way that they're winning is crazy. That They're smashing teams. They won two sets by 21 to 12, two sets by 21 to 10, including over Melissa Humana Paredes and Brandi Wilkerson, including in the finals over Kristen Nuss and Taryn Cloth. More on them in a bit. That at one point, when I was on the commentary with Rich Lamborn, Dream Team, absolutely love hanging out with Richie Rich, we were talking about how maybe their Achilles heel is the fact that they establish so many big leads that sometimes they get a little bit sleepy, and occasionally they have a habit of building up, say, a 14-9 lead in the third set, as they did in the Montreal Elite 16, letting that one slip away, or winning 21-10 and then losing the second set, as they did in the finals to Kristen Nuss and Taryn Cloth. They got the Theo theorem on themselves. But if that's their biggest Achilles heel, then, well, that is the best problem, the most first-world problem to have in beach volleyball. So Anna Patricia and Duda long have been my Sharpie team, uh, automatic. They're in number one team in the world. There is absolutely zero question who the number one team in the world is. They had 11 aces in the finals. 11. Eight of those came in the first set. That is just a silly, silly number. So Anna Patricia and Duda, number one storyline coming from Paris. Gold medal, fourth of the season. Unbelievable run this whole year by them. Good on Anna Patricia and Duda. And good on Kristen Nuss and Taryn Cloth. I've been watching Kristen since she was in college at LSU and also been watching Taryn since she later joined LSU transferring from Creighton. And this is the best I have ever seen them play. Yes, they have won gold medals this season. They won a gold in La Paz. They won a gold in the Uberlandia Elite 16. But I honestly think their silver medal performance in Paris was the best I'd ever seen them play. Just like Anna, Patricia, and Duda, they won pull, sweeping their way to it. Just like Anna, Patricia, and Duda, they absolutely dusted their semifinal opponent, a very good team in Valentina Guattardi and Marta Menegatti. And it was the one versus the two in what I think was very clearly the two best teams in the tournament. So Kristen Nuss and Taryn Cloth, they just keep getting better and better. They now have, I believe, a 640-point advantage over Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes in the Olympic race. So they didn't move up in the rankings, but they created a bigger distance from Kelly and Sarah, who respectively created a bigger distance between themselves and Betsy Flint and Julia Scholes. And so the American women's race continues to, there's a bigger and bigger gulf between the top two teams and team number three. And at this point, to me, it is a three-team race. I know that Alex Kleiman and Haley Harvard are sort of making a late push, uh, but with Megan Kraft and Emily Stockman splitting, with Sarah Sponsel going to play indoor for the Grand Rapid Rise of the Pro Volleyball Federation, it's 
To me, it's a three-team race unless there is some wild divine intervention for Alex Kleiman and Haley Harvard, who lost in the first round of the qualifier. Still remarkable that Alex is just healthy enough to play. So it was, even though it was another fifth for Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes, they're struggling in that quarterfinal spot where they get that buy out of pool play. Still a good finish for them. Obviously a huge finish for Nuss and Kloth, who almost came back from down 10-14 in the finals. Kristen had a high line to tie it at 14-14. Duda made a crazy dig, and then Anna Patricia just did this sort of windmill on two thing. It was the only place she could make, and that went down for a kill. And that's not an aberration or something strange for Anna Patricia to do. That's just the type of athleticism with which she plays. So huge tournament for Anna Patricia and Duda. Sharpie, they've long been sharpied. Huge tournament for Kristen Nuss and Taryn Cloth. I'm giving them the Sharpie treatment. They are into the Paris 2024 Olympic Games. The third biggest storyline from the weekend, to me, was Laura Ludwig and Louisa Lippmann. At the beginning of the year, I was pretty bullish on the German Federation. I love Sidney Tillman's game. I love her and Svenja Mueller. They're a little up and down sometimes, but when they're on, they're phenomenal. Now, I was also big on Carla Borger and Sandra Itlinger, and I was also big on Julia Sud and Isabel Schneider. Unfortunately, for the latter two German teams I just mentioned, they have had disappointing years. I was not bullish on Laura Ludwig and Louisa Lippmann. Laura was coming off the birth of her second child. That is no easy thing to come back from that and then play. Louisa Lippmann was transferring from indoor, which is no easy thing to come play on the beach after being a, a standout indoor player. I've seen a number of indoor players try to come out to the beach and fail. And so I'm never one to jump on that bandwagon. I was wrong. I stand absolutely corrected. Denise Austin, my good friend and fellow commentator at Volleyball TV, she mentioned early on, maybe you're leaving out the four L's, as she calls them, Laura Ludwig and Louisa Littman. And it turns out I did. I think Louisa Littman right now is playing as the best blocker. Just a blocker, not a holistic assessment of her all-around game. She's the best blocker in the world. I was talking with Jordan Chang, coach of Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes, about it, and, she, and he said, you know, it's not unusual for her to get eight blocks in a match. She, she does that on an almost regular basis. And for the third tournament in the row, the third fifth they've gotten in a row, Louisa Lippman finished the tournament in block. She had 27. Number two was Taryn Cloth at 21. Number three, Valentina Guattari was at 20. And then behind her is, oh, just one of the best defensive players to ever play the game. Laura Ludwig, in my mind, she's in that conversation. I don't think anyone can take that away from Misty May Trainer. She is the GOAT defender of all time. Laura Ludwig, I think, is right up there as number two. Dude is making a case for that. As her career progresses, she'll be in that conversation. So you have the most formidable blocker in the world, the blocker who's blocking more balls per set than anyone on the planet, in front of one of the best defenders to ever play the game. They haven't yet had a full breakthrough, but it's coming. They swept through the qualifier with absolutely no issue. Their win over Anouk Verge Dupre and Joanna Mater was shockingly easy. I was on the comms for that one. And this is an Olympic bronze medalist team and a, a team that always contends for a European championship. And Ludwig and Lippmann, it, they just cruised. No problem at all. Lippmann asserted herself early and Anouk just had no answers offensively. <laughs> Sorry if you can hear producer two in the background have a little cough fest as he's eating. But Laura Ludwig and Louisa Littman, uh, consider me, uh, I stand corrected on my hesitation. I am on the bandwagon. I think given their trajectory, they're going to be a top 10 team come the end of this qualification period in June 2024. So I'm on the hype train of Laura Ludwig and Louisa Littman. Count me on board. Fifth place finish. Uh, was another big one. They should now be out of the qualifier. They've taken three straight finishes in Edmonton, Hamburg, and Paris, all coming out of the qualifier. That is remarkable. Now, they're going to be in-world champs. They have a bronze medal at European champs. They should be out of qualifiers moving forward, but we will see what their entry points look like after world championships. Uh, two smaller storylines that I want to note for the women. Uh, Katya Stam and Raisa Schoon. They won their first medal since winning gold at the Doha Elite 16 in February. Huge for them. They had just lost in the qualifier in Hamburg. A bit of a disappointing loss as well because it was to Francis Lezana Plachet and Alexia Ricard. Sorry if I'm pronouncing those last names wrong. I always forget if it's Placet and Richard. Granted, you know who I'm talking about. But uh, it was a big one for them. They should be out of qualifiers moving forward with a big bronze medal. They beat Valentina Guattari and Marta Manigotti, who 
also had a big finish as it was their second Elite 16 semifinal. They're still awaiting that first Elite 16 medal. However, given that Valentina is just 20, high, high hopes, high ceiling for this team, especially with another eight months to develop prior to the Paris Olympic Games. And before we move on to the men, we are going to take a quick YAK water break. Now we have uh, we are going to re up our partnership with Gooder come Q1 of 2024. So no shades on for the men's side, but we did just add a new sponsor. I'm not sure if you can see it in the shot, but we have bartender in a box. Costs just 20 bucks to get a box full of Mai Tais and margaritas. It's pre-mixed up. You just, boom. It's like a box of Franzia, sort of. You, you just hit the little dispenser into your cup. Bingo. 20 bucks. You can have 12 friends. A uh, little tipsy. Some libations for 12 for 20 bucks. We'll take it. So we'll be having some uh, bartender in a box episodes as the season winds down, if it ever winds down, moving forward. Now, on to the men. Now, I know that Andre Perisic and David Schweiner won gold. It's their second gold of the season, following up on a gold in Uberlandia, where they beat Anders Moe and Christian Sorum in the finals. My biggest storyline is Alex Brower and Robert Musin finally getting on the podium again. Man, it's weird to see these guys not on the podium. They're so freaking good. Just the Bash brothers coming out of the qualifier, their first qualifier since Vienna of 2019, and they beat poor Chase Budinger and Miles Evans, who played great. Bad draw, beat them, crush Spain, and then come out of pool. Six of their seven main draw matches went to three, and they just kept on winning and winning and winning. Ended up winning the bronze medal match over Julian Horrell and Alex Horst of Austria. More on them in a second. Also in three. It's their first medal since Paris of last year where they won silver and lost a belter to, I believe, Bartos Wojciak and Michael Brill. Might have to fact check myself on that one. But it was huge for them. Uh, now they're going to be out of the sort of doom loop that is being in these Elite 16 qualifiers. And they're going to be back in the main draw moving forward. Massive finish for them, especially heading into World Championships. Uh, number two storyline, I'm, I'm calling Andre Perisic and David Schweiner the slow roasters of the year. The Paris Elite 16 was just their fifth event of the season. And they're just so good. Uh, you watch how disciplined... They are. David Schweiner is, I think, the World Tours version of Trevor, where no one gives him the proper credit. Where he, just because he's not doing any crazy stuff that's going to end on Instagram, this dude is the most disciplined, error free volleyball player out there. And they just win and they win and they win. And in Paris, they just won and they won and they won. They lost just, they dropped just two sets the whole tournament, both of those to Nils Ellers and Clemens Vickler. More on them in a second. Ended up winning both of those in three to win their second gold medal of the year. They have just five finishes. They jumped from number 29 to number 19 in the Olympic ranks. And it's too early to Sharpie anyone because you need 12 finishes. And so I can't put them in Sharpie to qualify. But for all intents and purposes, yeah, I'm going to Sharpie them into the Paris 2024 Olympic Games. It would be shocking if they don't make it. They're easily a top five team in the world, can win any tournament that they play. The next storyline for the men, number three, is the aforementioned Austrians, Julian Horrell and Alex Horst. They made a huge jump. Now, these dudes, they just took a fourth, and they barely made it out of the qualifier. Their match against Trevor Crabbe and Theo Bruner, I was on the comms for that one, and my heart has just recovered. It was wild. So just for those of you who haven't watched it, and if you if you haven't watched it, I highly recommend you go back and watch the replay. The qualifier matches are on YouTube, not on volleyball TV. So go find that. I believe it's court three on YouTube and of the afternoon session of the qualifier. So they split the first two sets, pretty standard stuff. And then Austria goes up 7-1. Match is over, right? 7-1 in the third set. You can't come back from that. And then they sustain that lead. It's 12-6 in the third set. All right, I'm ready to commentate my next match. I'm starting to take off. And then all of a sudden you blink and it's 12-12. And then Horl sides out 13-12. Trevor and Theo side out 13-13. Trevor walks into a line shot from Horrell and then has a swing for 14-13 and it's blocked. And then Horrell gets Trevor in trouble with a, a mean dancing float serve. Trevor hits an error 15-13. So this is a long way of saying that they barely made it out of the qualifier. That's the margin 
that the razor thin margin you have at this elite 16 level where these guys almost completely tanked in the third set. I mean, they did tank in the third set. They just barely survived. And then they took a fourth. And I don't think that that's going to be enough points for them to get out of elite 16 qualifiers going forward. It'll, a lot of that will depend on world championships and how they do there, but it's a massive finish points wise, because that's going to get you higher seating in these elite 16s. And when you're in that elite 16 main draw, boom, I mean, you are golden. Then you have to take advantage of being in the main draw. So good on Austria. They are now number 14, number 12, pardon me, in the Olympic ranks and way ahead of their Austrian counterparts. At the beginning of the year, I would have put them as the third best Austrian team. Now they're the 12th best team in the world and number one in Austria by a, a, the most significant of margins. <laughs> Uh, On to the aforementioned Germans, a silver medal. That is their first final of the year. Both Ellers and Wickler are still looking for their first career victory. That blows my mind that Wickler hasn't won a tournament at, at the professional level yet. I believe he won a gold at the youth level, but he just keeps developing these sort of raw young blockers. He did it with Julius Tolley. They quickly became one of the best teams in the world, won some very big medals, just none gold. And now Tolley retires, goes to law school, takes on Nils Ellers, who was developed by Lars Flugen. And then again, Vickler develops Ellers into the point that in their semifinal match against Austria, Ellers was so good that they had to start serving Vickler, which is something you almost never see teams do because Vickler is as close to an automatic side out as you can get among defenders. And it was Ellers who was the rock. He was the foundation of that team getting into the finals. They didn't win, but the fact that they went to three twice with the checks and the fact that Nils Ellers is playing as good as he is, it's just such a good sign for the Germans. And I think that their games bode very well for Tlaxcala because you're at altitude and they don't depend a lot on points from the service line defensively. And that, that's the biggest indicator, I think, of success in Sox College, where teams who don't depend on big serving, big jump serves in particular, those are the teams that are going to do very well in Mexico and world champs. It, that's what I'm predicting anyway. So I think that they are heading in the perfect direction at the perfect time heading into world champs. Uh, the last men's team I want to make sure we shout out before we get on to everyone's favorite section, the struggle bus, which is it's full. This week, Uh, Sam Cotafava and Paolo Nicolai, there was a stretch there where they were one loss away from being back into challenge qualifiers. And now with a fifth place finish after a silver medal in Hamburg, after a fourth place finish in European champs, they are now number three in the Olympic ranks and they are the best team in Italy by now a, a decently large margin as Adrian Carambola and Alex Rangieri, they take their second straight 13th in an elite 16. So I'm giving Kodafav Nikolai Sharpie into the Paris 2024 Olympic Games. And now on to the struggle bus. So this is what everybody has been calling for me to do for probably about three months. My boy, Triborn, my guy came shock. They're on the struggle bus. They And at this point, you know, to get on the struggle bus, all you need is two bad finishes on the world tour in a row. And really all that can entail sometimes is two bad matches in a row. And Triborn and came shock, they have had two slightly below average matches in a row. They lost to Australians three, Australia's threes. Isaac Carricker and Mark Nicolaitis in the first round of the Montreal Elite 16. Lost in three. First round qualifier exit. 160 points total. Awful. Awful finish. Coming into Paris. Playing the Grimault Cousins. Marco and Esteban, a team that Tri had never lost to in his career. A team that came, hadn't lost to since 2014. With Ben Saxton. Lost in three. 160 points. And so now their entry points to uh, quote one of my favorite movies of all time, Jurassic Park. That is one big pile of shit. It's tough. When you have two bad Elite 16 qualifier finishes in a row, you have a two 160 point. So it's 320, 160 each. That is such a dinger. And now coming into the pool of death and world champs, if Try and Came don't make a move, their entry points are going to be bad to the point where they will be in challenge qualifiers. And that is not where you want to be. And anyone who is playing on the world tour level can tell you that. And so now it's getting to a point where try and came almost have to play the challenge in Goa, India after world champs, because it might be the last 
challenge event that they'll be straight into the main draw for given the state of their entry points. Now, a lot of that, of course, depends on how they do at World Champs. If they have a long run, maybe win a medal, make the semis, make the quarters, then, you know, your desperation isn't so high and you can save that finish. But given their recent trend, Try and Came are, are now, there, there's quite a bit of sense of urgency for them. There was before, but now, now it's up there with two first round qualifier exits in a row. Uh, Matthew Emmers and Steven Vandeveld, they have been on the struggle bus for a bit, but with a six-week break between Hamburg and Paris, just sort of refreshing who is trending in the wrong direction. Like Tryon came, that is their second straight first-round qualifier loss. They have not made an Elite 16 main draw since the Uberlandia Elite 16, and that was in April. So their entry points are down. And with the way that Stefan Bormans and York de Groot are playing, they took a fifth out of the Paris Elite 16 and Alex Brown and Robbie Musen, I'm finding it very difficult to believe that they have a solid chance at making the Olympics. However, again, world champs, all bets are off. Anyone can have a great finish at world champs. So if they don't have a good finish at world champs, I think DeGroot and Borman sort of run away with it. Brower Musen run away with it in the Netherlands. Uh, Vitor Philippe and Hinato Lima also have two straight Elite 16 qualifier losses. And boating even worse for them is that Pedro and Guto are playing decently well. They took a fifth in Paris. And then you have Evandro and Arthur who are playing well. And then you have George and Andre. So American fans, I just want to let you guys know, you are huge fans of all Brazilian teams. Because the more Brazilian teams get into that top 17, the more it's going to trickle down into teams seated 18th, 19th, 20th. And so you want Pedro and Guto to end up in the top 17. You want Vitor and Hanato to end up in the top 17. Because right now, Try and Kame and Trev and Theo are just outside of that. So the more teams that you can have knocked out due to country quota and have that trickle down, that's going to give the United States a better chance of getting that second bid via points. So just letting you know that unless Pedro and Guto are playing an American team, you're rooting for them. Same goes for Hanato and Vitor. Uh, I'm not going to put Adrian and Alex on the struggle bus. Um, some of you guys might want to just because they haven't broke pool twice, but they lost all three matches in three in Paris and and so there it's not you know to be on struggle bus you have to be playing bad I don't think they're playing bad it's just you just lose three coin flips unfortunate for them I think that they will play pretty well at world champs because they don't depend on serving to score points as I mentioned earlier uh on the women struggle bus Daniela Alvarez and Tanya Moreno the young Spaniards out of TCU uh, they have now had three straight qualifier losses and a ninth in the Edmonton Challenge, so their entry points have been just flushed. Now, granted, they're also sitting on a silver medal at the European Championship, so that's big for them. But again, like every other team, World Champs is huge. If they have a bad World Champs, their entry points are in a very, very tough spot. And the last team on the struggle bus, a very full, crowded struggle bus. At least there's a lot of company on it. Uh, Joanna Mater and Anouk Verger de Pre. They have two straight qualifier losses, and they have a 17th in the Edmonton Challenge. So their entry points, like a number of other teams I just mentioned, are in a tough spot. So to continue beating a dead horse, World Champs is so big for all of these teams on the struggle bus because if they don't take advantage of that opportunity, they are in a tough spot, what Theo Bruner calls the doom loop of being in the qualifiers of challenges in Elite 16s moving forward. So the next event, can you guess it? It's World Champs. I leave for Tlaxcala on Thursday, and I will be commentating every single day. So 10 straight days of commentating, save for, I, I don't think I'm doing the lucky loser matches in between pool play and playoffs. That's the only day I've off. So nine out of 10 days, I'll be commentating. I will be there in person with my buddy Clayton Lucas. Um, so you can look forward, hopefully look forward to hearing me. If you're not looking forward to hearing me, you can just put me on mute. I don't know if I'll do a road to Paris from Tlaxcala. I might do one in between pool play and playoffs. Let me know if you'd want that, uh, or if that would just be too much. We are bringing Frito, Daniel Fritas, our videographer down there. He's going to get, uh, on court film and video. He's going to get behind the scenes stuff of all the madness down at World Champs. So we will be having a video come out roughly every other day during World Championships, just giving you guys a look at what's going on in Tlaxcala, the madness of the bull ring. So look forward to all of that. I believe our first video of World Champs will come out on Sunday, 
and it'll be every other day thereafter. And then on Wednesday, we have a podcast with Kelly Chang and Jordan Chang. And then the Wednesday during World Champs, we have a podcast with Haley Harvard, who talks, as you could guess, a lot about her partnership with Alex Kleiman, how that came to be, and what their plans are moving forward. So, as always, my pleasure hanging out with all of you here. Chat and volley. It was my pleasure hanging out with all y'all this weekend at the Paris Elite 16 Chat and Volley. And there's my smiley fat son to say, everyone, hi, goodbye. And what do we say when we're signing off the podcast, bud? Shoots.